Sorry, my timer ran out. But Connie's idea of the world is shaped by her very limited experience, um, what she's been exposed to. And what she's been exposed to in large um, is the popular culture, um, movies, music. Um, so in that sense, she's incredibly naive um, about, I mean, I hate to use this phrase, but the real world, the realities and the dangers um, that are out there. She's been kind of sheltered in that home life um, that has been created for her by her family. So in the second half of the story, we get to see Connie at home and we also get to see that I mean it's not a I don't think it's a it's a mistake on Joyce Carol Oates's part to have that interaction with Arnold Friend take place at her home where she should feel safe where she should feel um, protected um, ironically while her family is gone so we know that it's a Sunday um, and Sunday, I think, is important. Some critics have noted that um, this, what typically happens on a Sunday, right? You go to church with your family, and there's that breakdown of um, morals in the, the family structure um, and the family unit. But um, we know that it's a Sunday, and she chooses to avoid the family um, barbecue um, in favor of something more self-serving, right? What does she want to do? She wants to lay outside in the sun and dry her hair, her beautiful long blonde hair. Um, so she sits in the sun, gazes off, she dreams of boys. There's that, that dream, uh, uh, that, that boy thing again. And critics have argued largely that the second half of the text is a figment of Connie's dream. It's, it's her psyche. It's not real. It's this dream like she falls asleep in the sun and she has a dream of Arnold's friend. Um, take that for what you will. Um, I don't know if I buy it. I mean, I buy it, but I don't know if that's my reading of it. But anyways, um, we do get this kind of dreamlike, um, imagery where she shakes herself awake and all that kind of thing. But, um, she's listening to her favorite radio station. There it is again, music. Um, and the, the thing about radio and music is that it connects us while being apart. Um, it reaches everybody everywhere. Um, but the next thing we know, there's this convertible driving up her driveway, something that she doesn't recognize. She knows it can't be her dad. And her first thought is, how do I look? There's that vanity again. It's not well, who the heck is driving up my driveway? I, I see somebody I don't know in my driveway and I'm on my guard, right? I'm sure you're the same way too. Um, but, and, and here we see Arnold's friend um, offering, I mean, what's the one thing that he wants to do? He wants to get her out of the house. He wants to take her on a drive. Um, he, in this car, this jalopy, a jalopy is a POS car basically, um, that's got all this weird writing on it. I want to talk about that. Um, I probably won't get to it in, in this video, but I will talk about it in, uh, we talk about the literary elements and symbolism and stuff. Um, but he drives up in this beat up piece of crap car with all this crazy writing. It's dented. It's, it's, it might be gold, but it certainly doesn't glitter. Right. Um, and I think that that's, Probably, there's probably something in that. Like if it looks good, it might not be good. Or fool's gold kind of thing. Um, but by offering her a ride, he's offering her that thing that she longs for. Um, that that sense of escape, that sense of, of freedom, right? What's the thing that you wanted when you turned 16? A car. Um, and 
Arnold's friend offers her off, offers her that. And one of the questions that she asks is, well, where are we going? Um, again, another allusion to the title there. But what's interesting is that um, Ellie, who we'll come back to, um, is sitting in, it's just, he's weird anyways, this 40-year-old looking baby. It's, um, He's listening to the same radio station as Connie. It's this connection. Um, she lets her guard down. It's a way that he can kind of trap her into this conversation. Um, hey, we have something in common. We like the same music. Let's go for a ride type of thing. And then we get to his appearance and Choice Carol Oates describes him in the weirdest way. It's like a combination of fairy tale imagery, things that are familiar yet not, handsome but grotesque. Um, and she says, and I'm taking from the text, he's got a round grinning face like a pumpkin, um, mirrored, metallic, mirrored metallic sunglasses, um, he's short, he stands in a strange way, um, and true to Connie, um, she notices his appearance, and she likes what, uh, she likes the way he's dressed, um, and, you know, with his tight jeans, his scuffed boots, he's lean, he's got this white t-shirt that's soiled, that white soiled, um, small muscles. He's muscular. Um, he, his eyes are like holes and he's familiar yet unfamiliar. And if you think about like the common sex symbol of the time, you get people like Elvis Presley, tight jeans, white shirt, dark shaggy hair. Uh, but you also get characters like James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. Um, and those would have been very familiar icons to her, both in terms in popular culture and movies and music. Um, and she connects with that. And because it's what she's experienced, it, it meets that ideal of what... Um, what she thinks um, this romantic lover interest should be, it should look like. Um, and, and then we get to this kind of animal-like imagery where he's got stubble, suggesting that he's older than what he really is. Um, he's hairy. Um, he's got a hawk-like nose. Uh, a hawk is a bird of prey. And he, she's a treat. He wants to gobble up. Um, and that's, that's weird. And then he starts to act all stalkery and calls her my Connie. He knows everything about her, that her parents are gone, that the lady that lived down the street is dead, that, uh, her best friend is Betty. It's, it's creepy in this stalkerish kind of way. And yet she, she doesn't, she starts to question it, but she still engages that, that conversation. And what I think is really interesting is that Oates describes his voice as this lilting, as if he were, um, reciting a song. And it's, it's also kind of goes back to that idea that she modeled this guy after um, Charles Schmidt, the Pied Piper of, of Tucson. And, um, sorry, the more he talks, the more familiar he seems with a slippery, friendly smile, um, the sing-songy way he talks. Uh, but she can't put it together, like something's not quite right, but she's not sure. The longer they talk, the more grotesque it gets, the weirder it gets. And when 
she won't come out. He makes her a promise. He says, you know, as long as you don't touch the phone, I won't come in. You got to come out to me. Um, he, he proposes all these, it's, it's, he's treating this like it's a date and it's weird. I, I don't know how else to say that it, other than it's weird and creepy. And he, I want to, I want to draw your attention to page 130. And um, in that paragraph, I mean, just listen to what he says to her. Yes. I'm your lover. You don't know what that is, but you will, he said. I know that too. I know all about you, but look, it's real nice and you couldn't ask for nobody better than me or more polite. I always keep my word. I'll tell you how it is. I'm always nice at first, the first time. I'll tell you how it is. I'm always nice. Oh, I just read that. I'll hold you so tight you won't think you have to try to get away or pretend anything because you know you can't and I'll come inside you where it's all secret and you'll give it to me and you'll love me now if you think about it I mean that's a very sing-songy way of talking but if you think about what he's saying the words he's saying but what it means it's really kind of bizarre he's using this really kind of poetic beautiful language to describe a horribly brutal um rape-like experience and it's it's like when you listen to the lyrics of a song that's really catchy and you don't really like for example there's a song that i used to I still kind of really like by Third Eye Blind. It's really catchy, that doot, 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 um, semi-charm kind of like. And you get, it's catchy, right? And you don't realize as you're singing it, oh, this is about crystal meth addiction. Um, it's like that. Like, you don't really get what he's trying to say. She doesn't get it. Um, but, I, but Joyce, we get it. At least I, I think we get it. Um... And then she stops, and it's like, after he says this, it's like he's wearing a mask. That idea of hiding the appearance, the reality, uh, the dichotomy between the two. It gets creepier and weirder. And we get to the final part in on, on page 134. I think it's the most ambiguous section of... Um, the text where she breaks her promise, she runs to the phone, picks it up, and we don't really know what happens, but all of a sudden something roared in her ear. She began to scream into the phone, into the roaring. She cried out. She cried out for her mother. She felt her breath start jerking back and forth in her lungs as if something Arnold Friend was stabbing her again and again and again with no tenderness. A noisy, sorrowful, wailing noise rose um, all about her, and she was locked inside it the way she was locked inside this house. And then all of a sudden, he's saying from the door, uh, pick up the phone or hang it back up, come outside, it's all over for you now. And I don't know what to make of this. I mean, I know what I make of this scene, but I'm interested to know what you guys think happens. Um, do, there's that blending of fantasy and reality. Um, and we get to the end where she willingly leaves. She's been awakened in some ways through this, what I think is a very, I think he comes in and I think he rapes her. I, I want to know what you guys think as well. Um, but she's been through this traumatic, violent experience. And what actually happens, we don't know. It's really left up to you. It's very ambiguous. Is it a dream? Um, does Arnold, where do they go? Um, does he take her off to kill her? Um, and I, 